Good morning. We're switching gears just a little bit, and we're going to spend some time in the book of Hebrews for a little while. The book of Hebrews is kind of its own category of thing. I mean, it, it fits with the rest of the letters in that it is a letter, but it doesn't quite read like the other ones do. It's somehow more generic and also more personal. We, we love to pick on the other letters because we can kind of place them in time. We can say it was written to a people at a particular place at a particular time. But with this letter, we can't do that. It was always supposed to be written more universally. And so it has a bigger scope. It has a bigger presence. It has a bigger agenda. This reading from Hebrews today presents this powerful revelation of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. In some ways, that seems like a lesson in fundamentals, right? You're all here, most likely, because you have an idea of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. But the author of this particular letter assumes that there's, there's more to know, there's more to learn, or at least a new way to look at it. Jewish rabbis for centuries, if not millennia, have often said that Scripture is like a multifaceted jewel, and if you turn it in your hand, the light hits different sides of it, and you see it in a different way. And Hebrews is one of those moments. It invites us to turn the jewel of Scripture just a little bit and see it a little differently. In these verses, we see the majesty, the supremacy of Christ as God's final word, the one through whom all things were created and who now sustains the universe by his powerful word. Christians of yesteryear used to call that picture the cosmic Christ. We tend to envision Jesus on a more personal scale. We think of Jesus as the kind teacher, the compassionate man, the, the, the dusty traveler. Hebrews is going to paint this picture of something much bigger, something more powerful, something more supreme and regal. But despite that divine glory, Christ humbled himself to share in our humanity, becoming like us to bring many sons and daughters to glory. So he is not only the exalted Son of God, but also our brother, who knows our struggles, walks with us through every trial. So as we hear this reading, we reflect on the wonder of Christ's divinity and his deep empathetic connection to us down here in our humanity. The word of the Lord from Hebrews 1, 1 through 4 and 2, 1 through 12. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son whom he appointed heir of all things through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory, the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now God did not, sin, did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels, but someone has testified somewhere saying, what are humans that you are mindful of them, or mortals that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now, in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. 
It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. And for this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. All of this lofty imagery, all of these grand ideas, yet many of us, I think, struggle day to day with the idea of being able to hear from God or to experience God's presence. We just usually feel so cut off, alone, isolated. And, and we can know here that God is with us always, but feeling it here is something totally different. In most days, knowing it here might get you through, but some days you need to feel it here. There's this deep longing this, for something, for some kind of connection, for something greater, yet we have this overwhelming distance. On those days, we can know that Jesus sits on high with God, but we need to feel him here. And Hebrews reminds us that God spoke in many ways through history, through the prophets, through visions, through miracles, but today, in a world filled with distractions and competing voices and a growing skepticism, people wonder if God is still speaking at all. We live in a time where the noise of our modern life often drowns out the quiet voice of God. People are searching for meaning, for guidance, a sense of purpose, just to know that what we do when we wake up every day to do the same things over and over again, that it's worth something and not a colossal waste of time. But yet, we still feel spiritually disconnected. Like there's this, there's just the people of old, you know, they seemed to hear directly from God. They longed to hear from the prophets, and we too wrestle with that sense of alienation from the divine, but we don't have that direct phone call. It's just, it doesn't seem fair sometimes, but it never has. Genesis 2, going all the way back to the beginning, points to this need for connection. God looks at Adam and says it's not good for him to be alone. He needs connection. He needs relationship. Humanity was created for relationship, not only with one another, but with God. It's been long said by a lot of people, a lot of people a lot smarter than me, that God is relationship. The very fact that God exists in this trinity, whatever that is, this idea of God as Father, Son, and Spirit, that God exists as more than one It points to something about relationship. It points to us needing to not be alone too. Humanity was created for relationship. But sin, brokenness, they've introduced isolation, separation from God and from each other. Many people today feel this disconnect deeply, sensing that there's more to life, but just unsure of how to bridge the gap. Or perhaps it's not bridgeable anymore at all. And that spiritual hunger, that longing for connection, it reflects our human condition, this desire to know God, to hear God's voice, to experience God's presence in this world where connection feels distant or lost or a click away, but always a click away. Hebrews 1, however, proclaims that God has spoken decisively and fully through his son. While God previously spoke through the prophets, now he has given us this ultimate revelation, Christ, who is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of God's very being. In Jesus, we no longer have to wonder who God is or how God speaks. God's character, God's love, God's purpose, it's all perfectly 
encapsulated and revealed in Christ. Jesus, who brings the very presence of God into our world. And that sounds nice here, but leaves us wanting to feel something more still. We still want more. We know that Jesus is not God's only final word, but he's also the one who made purification for sins, and now he sits at the right hand of the Father, signifying the completeness of his work, but we still struggle with guilt, don't we? We can know, we can believe that Jesus died for our sins, and yet we still mess up and we still fall short and we still feel cut off, guilty, wrong, undeserving, distant. We can know that through his death and resurrection, Jesus has bridged that gap between humanity and God. We can believe that that relationship has been restored, the one that was broken by sin, but we just don't always feel that close connection. Though he is supreme over all creation, he did choose to become even a little lower than the angels for a time. He did share in our humanity. He took on flesh that got old, just like ours does, that broke from time to time, just like ours does, that was achy when he got off the couch, just like ours does. He did choose to bring you and me and many sons and daughters to glory with him. In Jesus, we see both this exalted Son of God and the one who humbled himself to suffer on our behalf. So that we couldn't wake up one day and say, God just doesn't understand, because through his Son, he understands all of it. God's solution to our isolation, to our spiritual hunger, is found in Christ who reveals God to us perfectly, who draws us back into a restored relationship with him through that sacrifice, all those grand ideas. But also, in Hebrews 2, 10 through 12, we see that Christ, who is both fully divine and fully human, is not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. This profound truth highlights that depth of his empathy for us. Yes, he sits on a throne, distant and far, but yet he's also been right where we are. Though he is the Son of God, he chose to share in our humanity, to experience the struggles, the pain, the suffering that we endure. He didn't remain distant. He didn't stay on the throne or disconnected from our human condition. He entered it fully, becoming like us in every way except for one, except our sin. And even that, he chose to take anyway. And so as our empathetic brother, Jesus knows what it means to face temptation, hardship, suffering, to have to wake up and go to work every day, to have to parent children who don't always listen, to have to try to decide what's fair for everyone even though nobody thinks you're doing it right. As our empathetic brother, he's able to help us in our weaknesses because he has lived through them himself. It's not some distant God who remains aloof. This is a savior who draws near to us in our most vulnerable moments and pats you on the back and says, yeah, that was a tough day. I've been there before. And in Psalm 8, we marvel at this honor, this dignity of God that he has given to to us. You see, most gods throughout history have always kept the honor and the dignity for themselves. In fact, they've declared that we give it to them. One of the things I think makes the God we worship so much different is that our God chooses to give that honor and dignity to us of all things. Despite our frailty, though we are small in the vastness of creation, God has crowned us with glory and honor. And through Christ, we are elevated to an even higher position. In Jesus' incarnation, he lifts us up. He restores our place as children of God. That truth redefines what it is to be human. 
We are not left in isolation. We have not been separated from God's love. We have been connected to it so closely it's impossible to see where one begins and the other ends. In Christ, we are brought into God's family, embraced as God's own. And Christ's solidarity with us reminds us that we are not alone in anything. He walks with us both as Savior and brother. And with Christ as both the divine Son of God and our empathetic brother, we are called to respond to that truth of humanity by embracing this relationship, living in light of this revelation. So Hebrews invites us into this family with Jesus, where he is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. And what do we do with that? Well, our response is to trust in that deep connection, to rely on Christ as the one who understands our struggles and guides us through them. We see the same thing in Mark 10, which further emphasizes this need to approach God with the humility of a child. As Jesus welcomes the children and encourages his followers to receive the kingdom of God with a childlike faith, in that moment, Jesus is challenging us to let go of our pride, to let go of our independence, our self-reliance, our insistence to do it ourselves. And instead, to do the hard thing and to trust him to handle it. Just as a child should trust a parent to handle it. My kids aren't here today because Grayson's at a concert performing, and so I can tell this story and I won't get in trouble for it. Um, the deal I have with them is I try not to talk about them when they're here. When they're not here, it's fair game. Um, with my children, with Grayson, with Ellison, they're at this age where I have to remind them sometimes that I do, I do know some things and I can do some things just okay at least. And if they can just trust me to do it, it'll work out. But they have this, I think, this inherent desire to prove themselves, to show that they can handle it. And I don't think we ever grow out of that. I think we all stick with that. I think we all grow that within ourselves and we build that up, this, this need to prove ourselves. And so we want to show no weakness. We want to handle everything ourselves. But you just, you really don't have to. Perhaps that distance we feel with God is because we try to move ourselves further away to become more independent. Not because God has ascended onto some throne far away, but because we run away and try to prove that we can do it on our own. As if that would somehow make God more proud of us. But what we don't ever remember is that God is already proud of us. Christ is already proud enough of us to claim us as brothers and sisters. He's already told us he's proud of us. He's already told us that we're in the club, we're in the family. You sit on the throne with him. Paul tells us that Christ has become the heir of heaven and we are co-heirs with him. There's nothing left to prove. This call to humility, this idea of being dependent on God, it mirrors how we relate to Christ. Not just as a powerful God, but as our compassionate brother who cares for us. As Christ has shown us the ultimate act of love by sharing our humanity, we are called to live in communion with him, reflect his love to others. That means treating others with the same compassion, the same empathy that Jesus shows to us, particularly the vulnerable, the marginalized, and especially the people that you tend to think don't deserve it just as he welcomed the children. Our response to this place in the family is to live in unity with Christ and with each other, trusting him as our savior and brother and embodying his love in the world with one another. And what better way to do that than at communion at this table where we reflect on the profound truth that Christ, the exalted son of God, became our brother, sharing in our humanity to bring us into the family of God in this meal, we were reminded of his great love, his sacrifice, how he gave his body and blood so that we might be reconciled to God and to one another. 
Communion is this powerful symbol of the unity we have with Christ and with each other. As we take this bread, as we drink this cup, we remember that Jesus not only knows our struggles, but he walked them first, and he walks them with us now. He offers his grace, his comforting presence. So let us come to this table with gratitude, with humility, receiving Christ's love and sharing in the fellowship of his body.